So, Doug Allen, uh, a man of many talents uh, and many careers. Some of you might remember him uh, as a football player for Penn State for the Buffalo Bills uh, in the uh, uh, 1970s. Some of you might remember him as a faculty member at Penn State, an emeritus uh, uh, professor from the Department uh, of Labor Studies. Some of you might know uh, him as a labor activist uh, who worked at the AFL-CIO, was head of the Screen Actors Guild, worked for the uh, NFL Players Association. So always a fascinating take on a lot of topics, and I'll hand it over to Steve and Doug. Thank you, everybody, for coming out, especially with the weather. Um, for what I hope will be a very meaningful conversation and great to see my old friend uh, Doug uh, back here uh, today. So in addition to those things, I need to add two aspects of his career. One, because my college roommate from Berkeley is here, and the other because of what we're going to talk about. And that is in his concise introduction, uh, Mark uh, did not mention that uh, Doug, in addition to being on the undefeated 1973 team with John Cappelletti, and that they're going to be honored during the game, uh, and among the exploits of that game besides Cappelletti winning a Heisman Trophy, Doug blocked the, pawn, uh, the punt in the first game, where, and I say this as a Cal fan, where Penn State uh, defeated a very good Stanford team. So that to me was one of the highlights of his career. And um, the second is when Doug was the uh, deputy uh, executive director of the NFL Players Association, he became the founding president of Players Inc., the uh, for-profit uh, collective licensing arm of, for, for the NFL players. So Doug, I wonder, and you bring in whatever else you want from your experience, but if you could start by talking about both the labor side and the business side reasons for forming Players Inc. as a way of collective licensing the name, image, and likeness of, of uh, the NFL players. Uh, I'd be happy to. Everybody, can everybody hear me? As a uh, as a former uh, professor of practice here at Penn State, I know that uh, the attendance today had nothing to do with extra credit, so I appreciate all you folks <laughs> uh, And um, uh, there have been uh, players' images uh, used to promote products and sell products since the late 1800s. So one of the first ways that they were used was to sell cigarettes and cigars. <laughs> Baseball players were used that way. In the 50s and 60s, um, the players' associations were formed in the four major men's sports, uh, and, and, and these principles apply across any professional team sport in the U.S., including women's sports. Uh, I'm talking about the big four men's sports because they were doing it earlier and, and, and more successfully earlier than anybody else. But first baseball uh, cards became something that were uh, valuable on their own and became collector's items and were traded back and forth, especially starting in the 40s and 50s. Along about the 60s, the same thing started to happen with football players. And uh, both the Players Association, which is the union that represents baseball players, and the NFL Players Association, where I worked for 25 years, uh, began to get involved in um, licensing nil rights for professional players. Nil is name, image, and likeness. Uh, using the likeness of the player to, to make a product or promote a product or both. And um, uh, you might ask uh, how the unions happen to be the ones to do that. And it's a good question because there is nothing about being a union that gives you the right to, uh, to, to sell the image of your membership. That, that has to be secured from each individual athlete one at a time and that wasn't always easy in the NFL Players Association, but both the uh, Major League Baseball Players Association and the NFLPA uh, f figured out ways to do that and would market uh, those rights to companies that would make products like replica jerseys or bobbleheads, or would use those images to promote products in commercial campaigns or promotional campaigns for a particular cereal or soft drink, for example. And those were pretty, um, the, the, for both baseball and football players in the 
up until the uh, uh, late 70s and <coughs> 80s, um, those were mostly uh, generating revenue from trading cards. That was the big category. But the, everything else was a little bit incidental. And um, uh, one of the thing, and one of the things that happened, well, let's see, we were being in about the mid 80s to late 80s now, is that. Um, the NFL started to figure out that the NFL Players Association was using the money that, that it was generating uh, through the use of players' images uh, to sue the NFL. Uh, there was a big fight from the 80s to the 90s to, to try to secure player free agency. Before 1993, uh, NFL players had no control at all over where they played. When their contract was up, the, their, the team that they had that contract with could hang on to their rights forever if they wanted to. The, you, you didn't have the right, at, even at the end of your contract, when you were no longer under contract to go anywhere for another team, to play for another team. <coughs> so um, we, uh, the NFL figured out that, that we were using that money to sue them, and they started to compete with us to try to sign players to their own individual rights licensing program uh, using players and, uh, and the team logos and the league logo uh, uh, to take those players away from us. Um, the, but it, it's important uh, to, re to re the other thing to realize about this fight is that in order for the uh, NFLPA to succeed in, in suing uh, the NFL to get free agency, the, the basis of the lawsuit was that the NFL was an illegal monopoly. The, each individual NFL team is a separate business entity. And uh, it's not one, the, the, the NFL is not one corporation. It's, <coughs> it's, uh, each team is a separate individual business. To pay, not an yet. Yes. And, and, you can, and you can't conspire to limit the labor market by getting together with your competitors, your business competitors. I mean, if every grocery store chain got together and said, okay, here's the most we're gonna pay anybody who's a cashier, that would be a violation of the antitrust laws. That's creating a monopoly, an illegal monopoly. And that's the basis upon which we sued the, uh, the NFL. And ultimately, after five years, won free agency for players. So they got free agency for the first time in the NFL uh, in the, in the mid-90s. And it made a big difference. Uh, when, I, when I signed my contract with the Buffalo Bills in the 70s, I was the 27th player picked in the draft. And my total contract value for three years plus my bonus was $140,000. My salaries were $24,27 uh, 24, and $30,000. Now that same position, it's now a first round pick because there's more rounds, there's more teams. But whether you say take the first player in the second round or, or the 27th player pick, which is the first round, I, I figured it out a few years ago, but it's, it's, it's approaching $10 million, uh, more than half of which is guaranteed, as opposed to my $140,000. Now, my salaries were about uh, two and a half times what college graduates could, could expect to get on the average when they graduated, when I graduated. Now, I mean, you've, I don't know what college, what the average salary for college graduates is now, but it's less, certainly less than $100,000. It's probably 60 something. Uh, and the minimum salary in the NFL, I think, is over $600,000 now. So, and that difference that I'm describing is, is as a result of what the NFL Players Association did in court and did in negotiations. Um, but one of the things the league realized is the, how valuable our licensing rights were, because that's what paid for the lawsuit. The lawsuit cost $25 million. And there was no chance the players were going to finance that out of their pockets to that extent um, in those days. And uh, so we were really fortunate to have that resource. One of the principles I like to uh, use when I'm talking about labor relations in or out of sports is there are three attributes that count the most leadership, leverage, and resources. And this is an example of how important resources are because every one of the four major men's sports in the U.S., professional sports, basketball, hockey, uh, football, and uh, baseball, the players associations all do this kind of licensing. They do it in a little bit different ways. In the NFL, we created a for-profit entity. 
called NFL Players Incorporated. I was the founding president in the 90s. And, and we did that because the IRS said, uh, you're a not-for-profit tax-exempt organization as a union, and unions only get to be tax-exempt to do union kind of activities, to negotiate, to represent people in a union uh, collective bargaining context. Marketing their nil rights is not something that's in your tax exempt purpose. So if you're going to do that in an active way, you um, are going to have to uh, give up your, your um, not-for-profit tax exempt status. And that would have cost us a ton of money. So what we did instead was spin off, and then we did, this was legal, it was tested, spin off a for-profit subsidiary that was wholly owned by the Players Association uh, called NFL Players Incorporated. I was the founding president at the same time I was the assistant executive director of the NFLPA, the number two position there. And my wife, although we weren't married at the time, was the chief operating officer of NFL Players Incorporated. And she ran the company on a daily basis. It had about, at the time we were there, we left in, in the, you know, seven. Uh, there were about 40 employees uh, out of the hundred that the NFLPA had in total. Uh, and it, it gave us the resources to challenge the NFL successfully and secure free agency for the players. And in fact, it, that company has done so well that uh, players' dues are banked uh, by the NFLPA, and then periodically, if they're not needed for collective bargaining or to survive a strike or, to, or a lockout, they are rebated to the players. So players haven't really paid dues since 1993. That's probably a good place to stop. Um, so Doug spent a couple of years with the AFL-CIO, the major overall national labor organization, working on politics and their central thing. But most of your career has been advocating for workers' rights in two somewhat distinctive in industries, uh, professional football and the screen actors. Highly elite uh, talent, a uh, wide range of talent, uh, et cetera, and you've been advocating for rights for these workers. Um, talk a little bit about what you see as the similarities and differences between the rights of a professional athlete, the rights of a professional screen actor, and the rights of a big time intercollegiate college player? Uh, well, I, the, 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 the environment that uh, actors and athletes exist in has many similarities, some very important differences, but many similarities. They're basically they're involved in uh, unique and a rare talent uh, uh, business arrangements. Their people are, are paying them for their talent. Um, they typically have uh, fraught employment circumstances uh, where it's easy to, uh, it's hard to get in and easy to be uh, thrown out. Um, they're short careers often uh, in Hollywood, particularly uh, for women. Um, and uh, it, it, the, 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 the timeline is longer in Hollywood, but it's the same principle. Um, you're you're uh, more marketable, or less marketable the older you become, typically. Uh, that's true of football players, it's true of actors. Um, and, uh, but they're, they're, and one of the reasons I wanted to, to take the job after 25 years at the NFLPA was I thought it, it, there were a lot of what I dealt with Actors are represented by agents, football players are represented by agents, and the NFL PA had, was the first of the players associations to regulate agents. Now you might ask, what in the world does a players union, how do they have the right to regulate player agents? And the reason is because, and U.S. labor law gives unions the exclusive right to negotiate wages, hours, and working conditions. And that's what agents negotiate. They, they, the, the union in, in professional sports, and it's true of all four of them, or all of them actually, negotiates um, wages, hours, and working conditions, but with respect to wages, only minimums. And now they negotiate high minimums, but they're only minimums, and the rest of player compensation is typically negotiated by an agent. So the NFLPA took the position uh, a long time ago that that 
meant that agents could be regulated and required to meet a code of conduct and, and demonstrate their experience uh, to the union before they could be certified and allowed to represent the players. Now, agents were not very happy about that uh, and threatened to sue us when we imposed those regulations on agents uh, in the 90s and early 2000s. And uh, after they took a look at the law, they gave up and said, okay, you're right. Uh, you have the legal right to do that. And now all four of the big men's uh, sports unions regulate agents in slightly just, different ways. Just to stay on that digression for one minute, for those who are interested in global sports, um, uh, and whatever problems uh, Doug encountered with uh, NFL uh, or Hollywood agents were nothing that compares to what goes on in the world of soccer. And FIFA has just tried starting now to regulate uh, uh, agents in global soccer, and they don't have that special prerogative, and it's currently being tested in European courts. So, um, so that's an ongoing issue for, for people who are soccer fans. But to go back to, um, uh, based on that experience, um, what do you see as things that are in common and not in common with uh, college uh, athletes and sort of related to that question, uh, do you think it would be good or bad for big time college a a a athletes to be considered employees and then subject <coughs> to labor law? Well, let, let me ask the, I, I'm curious because there's a lot of students in this audience and, and faculty, let me ask you uh, if you think uh, college, uh, well, let's, let's restrict this question to scholarship athletes um, and obviously most of this discussion is about uh, football and basketball revenue producing sports that, are, that produce positive re revenue in most places, uh, particularly at the highest level. How many of you think that paying players for name, image, and likeness rights is a good thing and should be uh, something that's part of college sports in the future? Raise your hand. How many of you think it's not and shouldn't be? Uh, well, I, that, that doesn't surprise me. Um, I understand that um, attitude. Uh, I, I struggled with it for a, a long time because I think there are some real um, problems inherent in the transition. And, and you know, I did a presentation that Steve was there for, um, what's the name of the organization? The Knight Commission. Yeah, the Knight Commission, uh, what, six years ago maybe where I was talking about how the professional sports union player licensing model would, could, could be a, adapted uh, to college in a successful way that would preserve the amateur status of college players and would not, in fact, would, uh, would require that players not be employees. I think I've lost that argument over the last six years. I think, um, it's, it's pretty inevitable that at some point uh, college revenue producing scholarship athletes will be regarded as employees and can be paid for their name and image rights the way NFL players are, but also be paid for their employment. I mean, they'll be a distinction without a difference. Let me, let me follow up our poll. How many people think that um, major revenue producing athletes should not only be compensated for a legitimate exchange of their name, image, and likeness rights. Somebody wants, you know, AT&T wants to pay Drew Aller to do a meet and greet in front of the AT&T building to sell cell phones. Um, how many people also think uh, big time college athletes should be paid for playing for Penn State or any other college? Raise your hand if you think they should be paid for that. See, it's, I, a, it's, I, a, it's a small, and how many think they should not be paid for, for performance? For performance. See, here's the, here's the problem with that. The problem is that it's, it's very difficult to distinguish between those two. It becomes a, a distinction without much difference. Uh, it's hard to, uh, that, that, that if you can make that distinction more easily for instance, a gymnastics star that's big on social media who makes a lot of money from nail rights, uh, but none of her teammates do. Um, 
and it's it's different in re a revenue producing sports like basketball or football uh, because they're much more team oriented, and it it also doesn't depend so much on the individual uh, uh, fame of the particular player as much as it does the success and fame of the team. Now there are some exceptions to that, but in football and basketball, not many. It's mostly about the, the, the team history and culture and identity in the marketplace and the players part in that and I think there are some I, I'm, I don't have all the answers or solutions I want you to think as particularly as young people who are college students here about the pros and cons of this because I think it's going to affect uh, how sports are considered and dealt with and felt about <coughs> by uh, college students and alums and you'll all be alums someday uh, in football and basketball, particularly in the top schools. Uh, but let me sort of, if you don't... No, I just wanted to ask one more question to pin down that difference. So, um, raise your hand if you think that somebody should be able to receive money for their NIL rights. That formally they're getting cash for their NIL rights. That, uh, let, me give, let me use the example I've, I've used in many places. Um, last I checked, the 53rd player on the Dallas Cowboys earns just a little less than $40,000 a year from Players Inc. for his collect for his NIL rights. Okay, the 85th player on Texas A&M gets $25,000 for their NIL rights from a booster organization. Okay, but it's it's cash for their NIL rights. So raise your hand if you think that, without regard for what they're going to do with the money commercially, it's, it's good that if Texas A&M boosters want to pay this collectively, everybody on the team gets it, $25,000 to everybody on Texas A&M, that, that that's okay. Raise your hand if you, if you like that idea. Not many. How many people think that's not okay? Okay, so that, so, so one of the, questions is, depending on whether there's support for that idea, one of the ideas, and this doesn't come up with Doug Allen's experience in the NFL, but in Australia, I'm wearing the thing for the Rugby League Players Association here, for my solidarity for Doug. In Australia, uh, where the money is less, this happens all the time. You get these boosters paying for a player, and they're professional players, to sign with their team for less money than they would sign for another team because of a salary cap. And it's just called cap evasion. And so there are ways to do it. It's complicated, but there are ways to do it, but it requires people to actually think that there is this sort of difference. Uh, and, and I think one of the things that we all need to struggle with and how this model works in college sports, particularly revenue producing sports, but not exclusively, uh, is uh, this distinction between being paid for your new rights and being paid as an employee, which I think is going to collapse. Uh, and the law is going to say, look, if you're paying people and it's, it's based on their participation in this activity, how is that different from employment? Uh, and I think the fight to, to make it different is likely, although I was in that same spot five years ago in terms of how I felt, I think it's going to be very difficult to make that legally. Um, and that raises some real issues. One of which is what happens when the court says to college athletes that are being paid, uh, if it's across the board for the whole team, for nil rights, like the Penn State football team, what happens when the court says that makes you employees? Because the next thing that happens is somebody knocks on the door of a player's dorm and says, I'm from the union and I'm here to help you. Uh, and, and if they, they, those, those players will look around at what the pro players have done and say, why wouldn't that work for us? Why, why shouldn't we have, rather than have to deal each individually with a uh, university-sponsored collective or with the university, <coughs> why shouldn't we have our own representatives to take care of making sure that in this employment situation, our interests are protected under U.S. labor law? And in order to do that, somebody's going to come along and say, we're, we're forming a union of all of the um, football team's players in the Big Ten. Uh, 
Um, and it, we're going to be the union that represents all of those players. And each of the teams will be essentially a local union within that larger union. Um, now, one of the things that's going to happen is that union representative in representing his or her members is going to say, I'm not here to represent the interest of the university. I'm here to represent the interest of the players. And um, so this money you're spending that, that, that football produces, that you're spending on non-revenue sports, we want some of that back. You can do that if you want to, but this is what we want to come to the players who produce that money because they're football players. And um, that's going to create some real, <laughs> uh, some real tension between the university administration, a academic administration, players on teams, the whole process <coughs> of recruitment. Um, and and I, I, I think it's, there are going to be more problems than solutions, especially early on. Uh, in, in how that works out. Um, and I, I think part of it, I also worry, and I've had some disagreement from a lot of people about this, but I also worry about what it does to the culture of the university and its relationship with the team. And many universities have that relationship, not just Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan, uh, the SEC, uh, students and alums have a real uh, sort of cultural connection to their athletic team. Uh, it's part of their identity, it's part of their brand, it's part of their culture. And I think it's going to be harder to maintain the kind of continuity we've had at Penn State with that culture, with the football team, um, when essentially the players on the team aren't students, they're professional athletes who are employees. Um, how, how many people... Even if, they're, even if they're still students as a job requirement. Uh, I, I, how do you enforce that? They can, you know, if, if they're really good, they're going to leave early to go to the NFL anyway. Um, uh, I, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on universities and on the NCAA and on, and some of it will be legal pressure and on the conferences to say uh, we're not going to get, we're not going to push real hard on academic eligibility. Uh, let me let me go back to one of your mantras that um, I used to teach here all the time the combination of leadership, uh, leverage, and resources that are available. And um, respond to a provocative comment I made, oh, probably a number of years ago. Um, I was on a panel at the University of Pennsylvania, and some academic was going on about how athletes are employees, and they ought to be treated like employees, and athletic administrators are just rapacious monopolists, et cetera. And just then, Duke Delaney, the commi former commissioner of the Big Ten, comes in because he was the luncheon <coughs> So I said, well, I see Commissioner Delaney's here, and uh, you're just being spoken of. And, you know, if Commissioner Delaney was the Machiavellian, uh, rapacious person you'd think, what he would do is immediately recognize the Big Ten players' union, and then immediately lock them out before spring practice until they signed a collective bargaining agreement that is basically our current regulations, no NIL, no pay, no anything. Um, why wouldn't that happen in your view when you think about <coughs> leverage, leadership, and resources, assuming this union had the right leadership? It might, but then when it came time to play the first football game, what was he going to do? Well, by then, they'd be under a collective bargaining. Well, assuming that that, that had been one agreed to by then. I mean, it's, a, it's a, it, it, like any labor negotiation, including the one going on in Hollywood right now, it, one of the ways we used to express it in, in the union side of things is you have to last one day longer than the, than the other side in order to prevail in a, in a um, distributive uh, bargaining situation where each side has to, if they give, it, it, you have to give to get, and it's a win-lose negotiation. Uh, if you get it, the other side loses it. If they get it, you lose it. Sure. So if you're in that sort of circumstance, then it's a, a game of chicken where in order to, to succeed, you have to have enough uh, leverage produced by uh, striking one day longer than the employer is willing to, uh, to uh, uh, wait to make the kind of deal that will satisfy the union, and vice versa. Do you? Th um, let me uh, switch because I want to leave time for questions. 
with all the talk here, what is your, um, so there's no such thing as a collective as it's set up in college in the NFL. There isn't like a bunch of Dallas Cowboy football fans who pay a lot of money so they can do an occasional meet and greet with the players and the players just get a bunch of cash for doing it. The cash that the Dallas, that my 53rd guy makes is because mostly companies have paid the, NF, the Players Inc. so they can put up his picture or something like that in order to sell more products. Well, one of the, one of the principles in, in marketing the nil rights for professional athletes, the four unions that I've talked about in the four major men's sports, is you have to have everybody. Uh, and th th that makes the process somewhat difficult because you get each player individually and they all have to say yes. Now, because this, these programs have worked so well for the players, they all do. But, and there were some years when we struggled in the NFL to get some of the superstars, but that's all been resolved. And now every player in all those sports signs up for this licensing program because it, it, it pays them. But one of the principles is you got to have everybody. And then you can... What we did at Players Inc. was we worked with the companies to determine how they were going to market the players and, and, and the ways in which they were going to be used. We were actively engaged in the marketing. Now, some of the other uh, unions didn't do it that way. They, they were passive uh, licensors, gave the rights to companies, and then stayed out of how they used them as long as they didn't devalue their rights by doing something pornographic, for example. They had the right to quality control it, but not any right to say on how they would actually be marketed. We took the position with a for-profit subsidiary that we wanted to be heavily involved in how they, those, those uh, rights were used. I don't know if I'm answering your question or not. Well, but I'm contrasting the, how do you think, so these are corporations that benefited from this. Um, in your view, now, with NIL rights, major sponsors, particularly, to make it simple, official Penn State sponsors, can further activate their sponsorship by using players if they were able to work out that deal. What do you think the impact is of the fact that <coughs> Penn State players can just get a lot of money from the boosters without do, just by signing uh, their, their money NIL rights? Well, one of the things that players are going to find out, universities are going to find out, boosters are going to find out, is the money, the real money isn't in boosters. The real money is in corporations that will use the players to promote their products or to create products they sell to the public. That's where the money is. And, and one of the things that is going to be, uh, where, where this uh, sort of model that Steve is describing is going to fall apart is, um, there's nothing that says that these players who are using their or marketing their nil rights, even if they're regarded as employees, have to give those rights to the university sponsors. <coughs> they could give them to these to the competitors of the university sponsors. I mean, that's who's going to want to pay the most for them. If if the university is sponsored by Coca-Cola, uh, who do you think is going to pay a lot of money to pull all those players away from Coca-Cola, Pepsi? Uh, and, do, and take any category you want, and that's that's what we did. When the NFL started to try to pull the players away from, from our licensing program, because we were using it to sue them, we started marketing those players we had to the competitors of the NFL sponsors. And share why you stopped that. Um, they paid us a lot of money. Right. So one of the, one of the ways they it, 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 it long ago when it when we when we finally reached the agreement it was fifty million dollars a year. I don't know what it is. Well, I had a serious con I, had a, I had a serious conversation with a very thoughtful senior intercollegiate college administrator who basically suggested that in this person's view, the way to solve the current problems is to treat football players like employees and to have them in a union. Because if they're in a union, then you can go to the Big Ten Players Union and pay them so their players won't advertise for anybody else. And if you're all worried about all the transfer portal where players are walking around, that you can negotiate a collective bargaining for a union that if you come to Penn State and you're signing the Big Ten Players Union and you're gonna get all this NIL money, 
you cannot go play college football for anybody else for three years. And you can, you can do that in the NFL. You can't do that right now because they're just students who are transferring just like you know, any other undergraduate is transferring. Yeah, so but, for, so it's, I, I don't know if I, that's what you're But you're the antitrust expert, not me. But, but how is that going to work if the, if the Big Ten tries to impose that on the SEC? I mean, if, so if a player can't go to another uh, Big Ten school for the length of that contract, that doesn't you know, that doesn't mean he can't go play in the SEC, does it? It can if the collective bargaining agreement, if, if you're an employee, you could sign, and if you, I'll use this example, if you sign a four-year contract to play with Tottenham Hotspur in the <coughs> English Premier League, that, that contract, you're in breach of that contract if you go sign with Real Madrid. So now you, you have to be a player to do that, and but it, it doesn't affect this because this. So you could you could do well, that, and, and, but well, only if you had a collective bargaining agreement. But what Steve's talking about is another one of the. In addition to the collective bargaining issues and the employment issues, there's the issue of a, a contract of <coughs> provisions and how they would restrict your ability to move or not move. Um, and. It, it, it's going to be different in college because in, in the, the, the units of people that are affected by the pro sports uh, uh, environment are small. They're two, two, you know, 2,000 or fewer. It's going to be many, many more players in college, and I think it's going to be harder to... You're not going to see a solution that, that takes the whole of the NFL and puts everybody in one union that, that plays football, that, I mean, it's the whole of the NCAA, and put everybody in the NCAA that plays uh, revenue-producing uh, football, you're not going to see them all in one bargaining unit, I don't think. I think that would be difficult to accomplish. And to, to <clears throat> so before we open up for questions, I just want to throw out and then give Doug a chance to comment uh, if he wants. One of the uh, key things about collective bargaining is that you negotiate with the employer about what is the <coughs> overall share of revenue that goes to the players. In the national foot, most unions in the National Football League, it's about it's roughly 50 percent. In uh, the uh, in cr Australian cricket, where cricket has responsibilities to grow the game and do a lot of grassroots sports and things like that, it's about 30 percent they negotiate, with the understanding that about 20 percent is supposed to be spent on promoting promoting the game. Uh, Penn State uh, gets rough, it's a subject to roughly, let's just use a round number, uh, 150 million revenue that can be attributed to football. If you count the football scholarship right now as what Penn State's playing, uh, it comes to about 5 million that the players are getting out of 150 million. So there's a big so, gap there. Yeah, and then, the that's share. exactly the point I was making about. about uh, an organization that is a union that represents players is going to want to see that formula change dramatically because they're there at the bargaining table representing the interest of those players, not the interest of Penn State and not the interest of Penn State student body or alums. So I, I forgot to do this at the beginning. I would like to acknowledge uh, my friend and uh, fellow executive committee member on the uh, multidisciplinary Center for Sports and Society, one of the co-sponsors here is, along with uh, the uh, uh, All Sports Museum, thanks to the museum as well. But Mike Foreman, who many of you know, because uh, you had COM 170 or you just know him from around town, uh, uh, thanks so much for Mike for setting this up. And Mike is further doing duties in addition to being a great sports reporter for statecollege.com, a great colleague, and a great teacher. He is going to handle our audio visual by handing around the microphone. So if you have any questions, raise your hand and Michael, come on. Uh, but before we start that, I do want to make one final point, and that is, I, I'm not saying I think it's a good, a good thing. Uh, I think there are pros and cons to how this might work out in colleges. I wish it weren't. I, I you know, one of my, uh, uh, the co-captain of the team uh, the year before this season we're celebrating, uh, while I'm here in the 73 season, uh, was a, was a, a gentleman named Carl Shokowicz from uh, outside of Pittsburgh, in western Pennsylvania, a very typical Penn State football player, who got a mechanical engineering degree while he was playing football here, got drafted <coughs> from the Denver Broncos, and while he was playing in Denver, got his law degree and became a patent attorney 
and he, he, he was part of the unmarried fraternity group uh, when I played here, and I was part of the married uh, group with kids. We all lived together, and and so we didn't spend a lot of time together when we were students and players here. But later on in life, we connected, and and he was my best friend who unfortunately died about six years ago from cancer. But my point about him is he's so representative of the kind of student athletes that came out of this program over the last 50, 60 years. Um, he was somebody who uh, didn't depend on his ability to play pro football uh, and, and spent his time and energy here doing something, however you feel about Joe Paterno, one of the things that he and I butted heads on a regular basis when I was here as a player. Uh, he didn't think much of unions. Um, but whatever you think about him, uh, uh, aside, uh, uh, you know, otherwise, he did, he was, he was absolutely committed to one thing, and that is that you're, you're here to experience college life, academically and otherwise. That's why you're here. The way you're getting here is to play for the Penn State football team. But the, your purpose for being here is to be a college student and experience everything that means. And he, he was committed to that. We had a, an all-American defensive end named Bruce Bannon, who was a geology major with a 4-0 average. And he, had a, he couldn't come to spring practice because there was a lab he had to take to graduate that interfered with practice. And so we were having a pre-spring practice meeting, and Joe said, Bruce, come up here. Uh, I want everybody to know that Bruce is not going to be at very many spring practices because he has to take a lab that's required for him to graduate with a degree in geology. And that's where I want it. I don't, I, you know, that's more important. He, it won't, he won't suffer next season in terms of his chance to play or anything else. Uh, he doesn't, you know, it, I wish he could be here, but he can't because that's where he should be. And, and that's what I'm worried about losing uh, when we professionalize college sports is that kind of connection to what the college experience is all about and, the, and, and being part of college life is about because it'll be very insular if you're a professional athlete who's playing for a team that's got the Penn State logo on their helmets but otherwise has nothing to do with you and what you do on a daily basis. So I'm, I'm worried about that. It's why I've sort of raised these issues for you, especially as students and future alums, to think about. Questions? Somebody? I'm Hannah. Um, I'm Hannah. I'm from Massachusetts. I'm a junior broadcasting major um, looking to get into sports. I was just wondering if you think that the NIL for college players is going to ruin the realm of professional sports business wise. How do you mean ruin? Um, like, kind of, not like ruin, but is it going to make the professional sports different? Like, in a negative way, it's going to negative, negatively impact. I, I don't. I, I, I think, um, it, other than the, the competition, other than the fact that there, if there are lots of college athletes available to be used by corporations that would otherwise consider using professional athletes, I think that that there'll be some competition certainly, but I, I think the. The, at least in the NFL, the NFL and the <coughs> players are, are at this point a juggernaut that I don't think any particular college conference or team will, will affect dramatically. There'll be a competition. Corporations and people that use players to promote their products will have to decide to, you know, we want to emphasize the kind of uh, qualities of our product that college athletes will better embody or do we want to do it with pro athletes. And they'll do surveys that tell them which one will do them the most good, and that's how they'll determine what they do. But I don't think it will, it will dramatically affect professional athletes' uh, collective nil rights. Remember, that's what we're talking about. In, in pro sports, uh, I should have the one caveat. What happens in, in all of these uh, pro sports is if you, you, have, the, you have the freedom uh, to sign up with a company on your own, uh, and, and the union your program can't stop you from doing that. You don't have to do it under the collective. Uh, in, the, in the NFL, if they, if they use six or more players, then they have to get those rights from the union. 
Um, but if they use three players, they don't have to come to the union for those rights. So there's almost there's a natural kind of difference between emphasizing, you know, Tom Brady on the one hand, or emphasizing the six, uh, you know, best quarterbacks uh, at the same time, and it's two different models. So. Um, there's already some kind of differentiation, and there's plenty of room in the marketplace, I think, for however it develops pro versus college. One, one quick trivia question and answer for all of you. The, if you remember from statistics, high school statistics, the difference between mean and median, median halfway, the median base. Major League Baseball players' individual endorsement income, not collective, Zero, because there's just not that much of a market for that sort of celebrity uh, endorsement. Good question. Next question. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. I'm Dylan. I'm a marketing major from New York. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on Caleb Williams and that situation on whether or not, I mean, he's supposed to be number one pick and <coughs> he could sort of decide if he wants to go to the NFL or stay back at college because of how much he could be making NIL. So I wanted to hear your thoughts and what kind of precedent that may set. I mean, depends on where his agent uh, tells him he's likely to be drafted uh, because they're, they're the, one of the things the NFLPA did, and now it's true in all sports, is as soon as you sign a contract, the union has the, all of the terms of that contract, and they put it into a database so any player or agent can tell what players are getting paid. Before that, there was a big fight to get that salary information away from management, and before that salary information, everybody lied about how much money they made. Now, you, you can figure out pretty much exactly based on what happened last year, what you're likely to get this year, and judge that against your, 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 your college nil uh, market. But I think, I think we're going to find out that the college nil uh, market uh, attrits pretty quickly after you leave college and you're no longer playing. So it's not, it, your, your, your uh, marketability is going gonna, is gonna to be reduced in many respects if, you're, uh, if you don't become a professional. Um, so, you know, I don't, there's only a short window where there would be a real competition between whether you stay in college and collect the money or you go to the pros and collect the money. Uh, that's only going to be about a two-year window. After that, uh, you're, you, you know, once your eligibility is done, you're going to see your, your marketability go down unless you're playing on the pros. As long as, as, long as uh, the NCAA refuses to enforce the fair market value concept, and so boosters can just pay whatever they want for NIL rights. Do you see the possibility that a player, maybe not a Caleb Williams, but somebody who's projected as a fourth round draft pick might, but he's super valuable for whatever reason to this football team for one more year, might, the boosters might be able to provide him, quote, NIL rights that would change those incentives around? Well, the minimum being what it is in the NFL, uh, it's a pretty high uh, number in the NFL to, uh, to, to forego. So I think it sort of depends on what the relationship. Now, if he's making millions, and there aren't a lot of, there aren't a lot of individual college football players that are going to make millions out of nil rights, hundreds of thousands maybe, but not millions. So, if, you know, it's, you're looking at, I mean, quarterbacks in the NFL that are really good make $50 million a year. So if you're a really good quarterback that's making a million dollars a year from your college nil rights, uh, you know, and you're really good, then you want to be in the NFL making $50 million a year and, and getting all kinds of money from NFL Players Incorporated because you're one of the best players in the NFL and they're going to market the hell out of you uh, in addition to that. Uh, one more question after after this one. I'm all right. I'm, I'm all right. Okay. Yeah. I'm Vishal. Okay. Uh, I worked in two years. I worked for two years in Europe uh, in a sports law firm. So my question stems from the fact like uh, the salary you're saying will make the use of the term salary will make a player an employee of the university. 
how would it affect the labor laws and the ancillary uh, departments if the university says that, okay, we'll not be paying you salary, we'll use the term gifts, that the amount, whatever is to be paid, is a gift after every match. It, it doesn't matter what you call it. If somebody is performing services and receiving compensation under U.S. labor law, they're going to be regarded as, as employed. Um, and so the laws that govern employment are going to apply. And I, I, I think that's almost an inevitability. There may be some, I, uh, I, see, I see Paul Clark, a professor from my old department, the uh, Labor and Employment Relations Department, may have a, some thoughts on that. But, um, you know, I, I think it's going to be very difficult to, um, to, to, to characterize payment that will be regarded by most people as a, uh, a function of your performance as anything other than uh, employment. That's going to be, uh, that, if that isn't the case soon, I think it will be inevitably later. One other just quick add-on to that point is assuming, which may not be true, but assuming that you required the athletes to be fully registered tuition-paying students at the university, if you, had an, if you have a collective bargaining agreement that the students are employees, but the union is not particularly strong to negotiate a strong minimum, <coughs> you could conceivably have a situation where the marginal athletes on the football team now need to pay money to be on the football team. Because if you think of the, the reason that the Dallas Cowboys pays the 53rd guy 600000 and pays the 54th guy on their practice squad by about 100000 100, and then the 58th guy who gets cut nothing is because of a strong union. If you didn't have a strong union, you could say the, the difference between the walk-on and the number one scholarship player at Penn State, who's the fourth deep in the depth chart, is this much. We're going to pay that student $10,000 a year. See, I don't think that's going to work because uh, one of the things that's going to happen is, and it's, and it's already happening, one of the things that this le levels out is the idea that I'm the star quarterback, so I get the most money. That's not what happens with the licensing program in the NFL. The, it's a pyramid. At the bottom of the pyramid is an equal share dis distribution of the money that comes from nil rights, and it's the biggest chunk. It comes, and everybody gets the same check. And then on top of that, there are payments that are royalties for products that you can buy in the name of an individual player, like a replica jersey with, you know, Allen on it. You could, uh, you could, you, you buy that and pay for it. That player gets a split of the royalties. Uh, it's, half of it goes to the equal share pool and half of it goes to him. And, and then at the top, there are the players like the quarterbacks or, or the wide receivers or the really famous players that that make appearances and are the lead character in a promotional campaign, they get paid individually for that. But it's a pyramid like that. And, and I think it's going to be, it, it's a team sport. You're not going to see, especially if they're represented by a union, you're not going to see the union saying, well, the quarterback's the best player, so he should get uh, a more of this money than anybody else. It, it's going to be hard to, uh, uh, to justify that. I think, it, 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 in terms of how the money that comes from marketing and licensing is distributed. Now, the money that might come from uh, being playing as a quarterback, that's different. Uh, and and the, the, that's why in professional sports, each player negotiates his own salary. And the union creates a floor in terms of benefits and minimum salary, and also this money that comes from licensing. Uh, if that model happens, then yes, you may see quarterbacks in college making the most money as employees the way they do in, in the NFL. But the money that comes from from marketing their their name and image rights will be will be handled differently. Um, I think uh, if they certainly if they follow the pro model. Um, so the last question uh, he has a Doug has a major stuff with his teammates, so I promise to get him out the door by five o'clock. Uh, last question. My name's Mary and I'm Steve's wife and somehow I ended up with the mic. So I'm going to give you two questions which you guys can pick which one you want. 
One is Or we can answer both. You can answer both. They might be they might be easy. I hope I have one that stumps you. Um, one is where does it stand with being an employee if you're in a state run university versus a private university? And the other question is one I always love, who lets, who gets left holding the bag? Most universities are way over leveraged in their investments in all kinds of things. They projected that they're going to have far more students than the demographics are going to prove out. And they've been building like there's no tomorrow. They were planning to use a lot of this money that they've already sunk into football stadiums and basketball arenas. So if you could just comment on that. So repeat the first question. First question is, how state might it work out if you've got well, one union and state employees and private employees? Um, if they're state employees, there are there are state laws that govern government employees who are employees of the state. And there are federal labor laws that, that, uh, that apply to employment in general. Um, so that's a good question. I'm not sure that it, I, I don't know that it will, um, I, you know, the, the, the uh, I'm, maybe you've got a. <coughs> well, there's all sorts of state laws, and then there's all sorts of opportunities for state laws to pay pass specifically for athletes to ban unions and, and other things. Um, eventually, that may require federal legislation to create some sort of uniform uh, problem here. The second question is. It, this is not for Penn State, really. Penn State is makes money on its football team, and uh, our fortunately uh, enrollment seems to be not declining at Penn State as opposed to a lot of other schools. But for schools that are facing these sorts of problems, how do you see unionization or NIL or other things impacting? Uh, you know what's going on in all these other universities. I, I think it will have an impact just like it did in professional sports. It will have a major impact. It will it will uh, severely disrupt the current model. It will uh, make it harder for universities to spend uh, the money that a particular sport generates if they have to negotiate with the athletes as to how much of it stays inside the sport. Because the athletes, if they're represented by union, aren't going to care how much the, goes to the golf team. They're going to want to see how much goes to the football team. And I think that's unfortunately, unfortunate, even though I'm speaking here as someone who is a union representative <coughs> of professional athletes, I, I've always thought that um, we, should, we should have started 10 or 15 years ago trying harder to come up with a model that would, would work legally and would, would recognize um, the importance of uh, the contribution that those athletes make to the university without being in this sort of us against them mode. But at this point, I'm not sure there's any way to avoid it. On, on that somewhat auspicious note, um, it's 5 p.m. And I just so much thanks to uh, my friend Doug Allen for coming back and sharing his expertise. Um, you can reach me if you have any follow-up questions for Doug at just type in Steve Ross Penn State Law and uh, be happy to forward any emails you might have. Uh, thanks for your attention on this Friday afternoon and these great uh, questions. Uh, have a great rest of your weekend, including a big victory over mighty Blue Hens. <laughs>